Most of the people, like I said, if you are a professor being a fashion by a Western institution, how then do you know about African philosophy? What, what content are you going to bring? So we need to get out, move out of these structures, all of these institutions on the continent, and look for content because content is there. In Africa, you know, there's no continent or country in the world that possesses illiteracy that we have on the continent. Volumes and volumes and volumes of literature. All we have to do is to go back, dust that information, present it as it was before. How do you civilize the world then you become, you know, uh, at, the, at the end, you are now following your children? Hmm? Because you gave back to them. Huh? They are all your children. Now they are teaching you what you are supposed to teach them. Because of the ignorance, you are ignorant of yourself. That's the problem. That's why we find ourselves in this predicament. Because there is no leadership on the continent. All we are bringing is people that have been, you know, fashioned by Western thought. Nobody stands up there and says, me, you know, I, I, you know, I, I can quote, uh, you know, Shikha Tadjo. Those are great people. Theophile huh? Lomenga. Hmm? There, there, there are so many people, Abum Fundish, there are so many people outside this Western system that we need to rely on. And people that have actually showed in the way how it's done. Shikha Tadjo tells us about the oldest, you know, constitution in the world. It's an African, you know, constitution. So why is UNISA and other, you know, institutions not learning about that? Because that should be the basis of our, you know, constitution. It then poses the question, like I say, you know, Kaiki, I don't know what, uh, you know, what, what contribution am, am I going to make, you know, talking about transformation, because what, you know, we need to do, we need to remove, uh, I'll make an example. The father of medicine is immortal, not hypocrite. Yes. So, that's where it should start. We, we should now start teaching about Imhotep. But if our institutions don't, uh, you know, give us that information, you know, because they don't possess, you know, the colonizers told them this is the truth yes. and nothing else. Yes. So those are things that we need to critically, because you see, if we don't do that, see, there are generations to come yeah. for them to be slaves again. It's a generational test that we have to stop. And then, you know, people took con conscious decisions. They took conscious decisions to ignore what was there before. It's not like they didn't know. You can't sit in Ghana and not really don't know that uh, Kemet, you know, Kemet was, was, was the capital of the whole world. And Kemet didn't start in Egypt. Kemet started here in South Africa. The same people who went and refined all these knowledge and systems in Egypt, they started here in South Africa. That's how ignorant we are. We need to know about the Enki calendar, what is commonly known about you know, to be the, the Adam's calendar. Ubaba Ubabu Kredo talks about it. He calls it in Zado Elam. Those are proofs. Ubuti civilization started here. That's the oldest, oldest stone calendar in the world. The rules of the first city in the world are here in South Africa. So what are you guys doing? You're killing the nation. These foods are not doing the army, you know, continuously. And, and, and yet you're saying, you know, I'm a professor, yes, you're a professor, but what are you prophesizing about? <laughs> If you are ignorant of your own. <laughs> so we need to go and, you know, see, see, see Google in front of Abu Koko, Nabunkuru, because they still possess this knowledge. Menace is a thesis. And go to those people that we thought to Those are pure minds who have 
have never been colonized. They still possess this knowledge. Because the land of a CDC professor says a lie, he doing a lie. I bet no more in that reality. We present and re, re, redefine the African identity. I, I mean, you know, it's like South Africa colony in Europe. Young in Europe that comes with uh, we just accept. Hmm? I, I was not a dog, I who my would know. Nah, yeah. huh? Why are the land of the Buddhists is betrayed? Yeah? Since we are not Democrats. We are of royalty. Huh? The real blood runs in our veins. So now we, 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 we look at such things as Barbarism because the white man they told us that it was barbarism. Huh? We, we, we don't even, you know, take time and, and, and look at it. You know, the greatest, greatest government structure of the continent that brought civilization in the world goes. After we cause nothing happened on the continent, we were then slaves. And how did we become slaves? Because of self-preservation. There was a strong empire on the continent called the Great Empire of Kemet. Yes. It had its branches here in South Africa. They called themselves Bonavakuru Baseke. Yes. That was the greatest empire that ruled the world. But because of self-preservation, some of the kingdoms decided to sell out. That is why we find ourselves in the situation we are in today. And the that same sickness is a call and an answer. Because why do we have as black people? Why do we have so many political parties? How do you give birth in 94 to a child and say sugar? There was no, there was no maturity there. Because the problem, the ANC problem, the EFF, the EGAT, is the same thing. So why is it sugar? Why is it sugar? It's about power. Self-preservation in the corner. Uti mina me better manager of a western construct. Industry is an island, and nothing else. But what happens to the majority of African people that expect leadership from us? Continue betraying them. Why? Because I want to be a billionaire. I want to be seen to be the smartest amongst all of them. There's no maturity there. Let no in our problem needs us to unite. I'm telling you, if we can do that, 10 years is it's more than enough. We can transform South Africa. Firstly, economically. The billions that leave our townships every, every year. Go where? Who are we supporting with these billions? Instead of containing that money to circulate amongst us. See, as the Shupeg is at in herself, and we must stop pointing at the white people. The problem is no longer white people. The problem is us in some the way. We still suffer the residue of a colonial mindset. Because if we clean our minds, we will begin to think like normal people again. So, that's why it needs to start. In revolution that we need, the last mind, we need to walk this revolution. And as a, as a collective, a united force, not to put in ANC claims this, EFF claims that, EIP claims that. That is nonsense. I'm sorry to use that language. But that is taking us nowhere. We need unity, even just to fix the content. We need unity because that form form of the constitution. It, has, it needs a majority, a two-thirds majority. How are we going to achieve it when, you know, the IFP says, no, I mean, I'm not, I don't agree with you. Huh? 
Because then somebody said, no, you must tell this lie. He ain't seen I on the picnic. Who gets, who, who gets affected? It's ordinary people. And then, yes, it's the Ula, yes, it's Zadwai. Sitting in Asa. Let us think like other people where they plan 100 years the future. What you are doing now, you know, but it will benefit generations to come. Many things that are going on do them. Many of them are not going to do them. I'm fine. I'm so small and the rest. We should be planning for hundreds of years to say whatever decisions we take now are going to affect generations and generations to come. Like this uh, immature decision we took in 94. See, I love my family because of that uh, decision. See, I will love my family because of that decision. It was very immature. Yes. We're supposed to unite. We're supposed to unite in 94. So, my case, message I see, I see, I see, let us unite so that we deal with the fundamental problems of our nation. The African nation. We have seen Kula Soke, Mufana, Africa, Yoke, everywhere. We have Jamaica, we have US. The condition of a black person is the same. Because you have moved away from your power. Tina Sinabandu Bongo, a spiritual people. That is the, the, the basis or the source of our power. Now, when you move yourself and unplug yourself, you become vulnerable. You find them sad. Can you, everything has to be informed by your talk. Israel and sad and the child my cousin and my cousin asked. There were no political formations then. When it comes back, Abu Sabuyel was able to say, give us a fresh mandate. Then this illness, self-preservation, surfaces. Huh? Then the Bamba went up and said, No, I mean, I'm a better manager of a Western concept. That is why we're here. So, the solution to all our problems, we all have a problem with the and the symptoms. And we go nowhere. We need to go to the root. Look at the end of our social situation. In the end of 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 the end Unifying 
you know, the black nation because we've been affected colonization, apartheid, siakula, siti and only the truth can heal us. Our next speaker for the plenary session is Kim Keller, who is going to address us on the never ending story of white supremacy, power, and privilege in South Africa. Kim Keller is a writer a political analyst and a communist. She's, she has published throughout Africa, but not the mainstream as a media. She's writing books, and currently I see uh, two books here, and she's an advocate for radical economic transformation. And she's a former deputy secretary of the Economic Freedom Fighters in Africa. I am speaking today about the never-ending story of white privilege, supremacy and power in South Africa. And it's a story that's very tragic because we speak about ourselves as a free nation, but we are anything but a free nation. And I would like to read uh, introduce myself uh, because I was described as a writer and a political analyst, I think a communist, well I don't believe any communists in, in the country anymore, so let's wipe that off the sled. Uh, and I'd like to reintroduce myself as what I believe describes me best, especially for this discussion. I stand before you today as a white settler, I stand before you today as a foreigner, and we have had these debates, uh, this tragedy around uh, xenophobia, and yet the media and, and academics aren't asking who are the real foreigners in this country. And you have one here, but there's no attack on me as a white person. Um, so, you know, that's tragic, so I, I'm not one of these people that believe that there's such a thing as a white African. I don't think such a thing exists. So perhaps I stand before you as a white person on stolen land and as somebody who shouldn't even be here. And, 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 that's, and that's tragic, especially in the spate of xenophobia. But let's go on to, to some of the things that I'm going to say and I may, you may find that what I'm saying is quite disruptive to the theme of uh, decolonization of, of the syllabi. And I want to start off with a quote of one of my favorite uh, revolutionaries. I hope some of you are studying him in your courses and that's Franz Fanon. And he speaks about white supremacy. He says the white man wants the world. He wants it for himself alone. He finds himself predestined, master of this world. He enslaves it. You know, in a way, you have to admire white people because they don't give up power easily. They want everything and they make sure that they keep it. And that is, that is happening in, in our country. I often describe, one of the books I'm writing about is on white supremacy and how South Africa is a, white, is a wonderland for white people. It's a beautiful place. It's a place of plenty. I've written about the after party of, a part, of apartheid still being present. White people are enjoying a land of plenty. And what's happening with black liberation? Black liberation has been pushed to the sides. It's a stillborn concept. And there's a wasteland. South Africa is a wasteland for black liberation. If anyone thinks black liberation is taking place, they're very much mistaken. So, one of the questions I have, even with this topic, is how do we even speak about decolonization of the syllabus while black South Africans are living like squatters on their own land and people like myself are living like squires on land that was stolen. And I, I hope today there's a discussion on the fundamental issues that we have to address in society like this because you can't decolonize a syllabus and remain landless. It doesn't make cognitive sense. So, I have a question, you know, maybe uh, Honourable David, it's why maybe I, 
I'm happy with me raising this in the context of this, but I question the, the topic that's even being discussed. So we have to look at how, how did we get here? How did we, we get to a situation that 25 years into democracy, we are not being governed by a black government, we are being governed by whiteness. Uh, people who say white not the capital doesn't exist. I don't know what universe they're living in. So we are living, we are living in a society where whiteness reigns supreme, whether we like to admit that or not. And I think we got here for a number of reasons that we must unpack. The first is the Freedom Charter. I mean, the NC made this terrible mistake in 95, uh, what, 1955 with the Freedom Charter, which, is, which has actually governed our consciousness ever since. But it's a document of black surrender. It's not a document of freedom. And I must say, I, I spoke at the beginning to say I, I stand before you as a, um, as a settler. Uh, and I also stand before you today as, as a recovering charterist. <laughs> For many years, I actually was a very devoted person to the NC. And it took me a long time, you know, cognitive dissonance. Do any of you deal with cognitive dissonance? You know, it comes and it hits you, it hit me a bit late to, to realize that uh, what I thought was a black government looking after black people was actually a black government looking after white people. And I think that the, um, the, the charterist movement is, is very problematic. I mean, the Freedom Charter embraces the oppressor with the oppressed and gives him rights over land of this country. It's insane. And I would, I would like to put out a request to all the students and academics around here. Possibly, I mean, are there some EFF students here today? Yes. Ah, okay. So, uh, fighters, I, 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 I ask you, I beg you to have a look at the Freedom Charter, because you've also adopted it. But I assume that you've adopted it in a more revolutionary way than we see from the ANC. And do we, how do we interrogate it to make it a doctrine that speaks to black interests rather than white interests? I mean, it was written by a white man, that, and uh, that is why we have uh, the, the white people being uh, given uh, moral authority over land. That's insane. So what we've got is that it's, charterism entrenches colonialism. So I don't understand how you can have a society that is based on a constitution that, that favors charterism and a freedom charter Bible that is a document of total, total surrender. And perhaps when we realize that and academics write more about that, we'll start freeing ourselves. I've written a lot of pieces on the Rainbow Nation. I mean, none of my stuff mostly is published in South Africa because the mainstream media really dislike me, I'm not sure why. But uh, I wrote a piece for a few years ago which actually trended, and I think it got almost a half a million reads, mostly out of this country or in alternative media. And I said, it's time to shut down the Rainbow Nation. I said, any patriotic person in this country would shut down the Rainbow Nation because it is, it's damaging who we are. And I wrote in that article that the Rainbow Nation was consummated on the bloodstained bedding of colonialism and apartheid atrocities. And it delivered a stillborn democracy. And to carry on with the system, it's just going to give us more and more of this. What we have is we have the architecture of colonial, colo uh, of, of, of colonial control. We have the power relations of, of colonial control. Nothing has changed. So I describe, the rain, I describe the Rainbow Nation as a tender that has extended white power and privilege. That's all it is. In fact, in 1994, black privilege and power was jackpotted. And what the ruling party has done, they've, all they've done is they've, they've tinkered meaninglessly with the, with the power relations, with the economic relationships. They've included certain black people in the system, but that has excluded most others. And so we have the, the full logic and patent of colonialism affecting everything that we do. And this is in society, it's in economy, it's in institutions. So we are captured in a state of colonialism because nothing changes. As our first speaker was saying, we, we try and play with the system, we, but we don't destroy it. And this system needs destruction. Uh, in my writing, I've, I've spoken a lot about how reconciliation is actually a white man's medicine that is harmed, not healed. And that's exactly what it's done. So we have this desire to reconcile 
and that all it means that whites have reconciled with their privilege and blacks have reconciled with their poverty. And the ANC seems to be obsessed with the social cohesion and uh, at any expense. So they have put social cohesion well above what black interests. And that's one of the problems that we have because that has puffed up the white voice. It's actually supersized white, uh, white entitlement. I mean, you see white people very easily speak about racism all the time. They don't even seem to care. And then they know there's a small apology at the end of it. Yeah. So we need to, in, in analyzing the situation, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to put together some things that I think could help. But the ANC's motto to me in its ruling has been, since it's come into power, and maybe before that, I believe the signpost is almost do not disturb white privilege. So unfortunately, uh, it's taken me a long time to realize that the ANC, a party that I once loved, actually is uh, not a party that's going to empower the majority of black interests. If there are ANC people around the table challenge me, I'm happy to, do, to speak on that. I mean, I, I can tell you now, I've written, and I, I said this at the NC Land Summit, and you, you can remember it next year, come here again. The NC will never take land back from white people. Yeah. Trust me. Of course they yeah. will. <laughs> and um, I made that prediction last year. I said that uh, the NC, I think the, the desire to speak about land was an expropriation of people's votes, not land. The ANC will never take back white land. They will take back state land, they'll take back unused land. They will not take away land that was stolen, prime land. Uh, trust me on that. And um, what we have a situation of is land delayed is land, de is de land delayed is land denied. How, how much longer must people wait for? What we've got is we've got an economic system of accommodation. So a few choice blacks are included. But the system itself has not changed. And the system is not made for black success. And then in the intellectual space, we have uh, intellectual copywriting. Uh, sorry, copycatting rather than copywriting. There's not much being said that's new by black academics. There's a tendency to copy and mimic what is being done uh, by white colleagues. So we have a white world. We have a white word. The will, and, the will and word of whiteness remains supreme, not only economically but socially in the media and in the academic spheres. And I've spoken, I think I spoke a little bit, a little bit about how black opinion mimics whiteness and we, the only state of reproduction of what came before, not uh, reconstruction. And I think it comes down to a lack of uh, mental consciousness, because black academics tend to, I don't know if you find this in UNISA, but tend to frown on their own image, except for one. All the experts that they brought in were white. And I found that very interesting, because where do you have such a thing as a white landless person in this country that can understand what that feels like? But it's all these Ruth Halls from the University of whatever and the Western Cape, Tim Cousins, I'm not criticizing them, I don't know who they are necessarily, I'm sure they write very sweetly, but why would they be brought in by the ruling party to discuss the issue of land, the most important thing to black people? And what is very interesting, and then after that session we broke down into groups, breakaways, and I went into one group, there was ex-president Zuma, I think Khalima, uh, ace, or just like really top people. We all sat discussing the um, constitutional changes and in the, in the usual ANC stuff nothing really happens and they weren't very revolutionary. But I saw two things happening in that forum which worried me. First of all, they were using the, the language of white, whites used to describe land. They were speaking about land invasions and uh, like as if black people are land invaders. So I stood up and I challenged those things because we introduced the language into our dialogue and our discourse that is often very colonialist because um, you don't, uh, how, how could there be land theft and land invasions when it's black people taking their own land back? So I, apparently I, see, I, I raised that and it was, was not, it was frowned upon. The second thing is at the end of the session, despite all these 
very senior people being there, the NC, uh, the, the Premier of our province, David Makuru, then asked somebody to scribe. But he didn't ask any of the black academics, he didn't ask any of his comrades, he turned around to Jeremy Cronin, the only white person in the room, and said, Jeremy, would you write this up for us? And I just laughed because I thought there's an outsourcing always of intellectual tasks to white people. And that's certainly been the history of the ANC. And I think in some ways, it is the current day life of many in institutions that call themselves black institutions. The only other point I wanted to make on this matter was that I found it quite strange that I think it was the chief whip of the ANC who um, muddled up some words a few weeks ago and it, was, and it was trending on Twitter. Did you any of you see that? Yes. And there was great hilarity about all of that. And you know, I found that it was very sad. I was actually going to write an article about that. It's because we actually see speaking English as a badge of education, as a badge of, a badge of intelligence. So, and, and it's bizarre, like I find it very hurtful that, you, that people would attack, black people would attack a woman because she was speaking English not so well. So anyway, that's, those are just two things I wanted to raise that I thought were very odd. So we need to ask um, in the institutions, I mean in our society, the agenda, in my view, is being clearly set by white monopoly capital. I mean, we, have, we don't have any free media. Um, and, I mean, I seem to have been boycotted, any radical voice has been boycotted on our stations. Um, so, we have one narrative. And in a way, the universities are carrying that narrative through, because there's no challenge of it. So, the agenda is being set by whiteness, by white business. And uh, you need to ask, uh, our question is like, if this is happening, are black academics taking themselves seriously at all? Because you're not putting yourself in the forefront. You're just mimicking whites, you're copying whites, you're in the shadow of whiteness. Um, you know, it's a painful situation. And then there's this thing which I love called the peril of white praise. I find that black people love to just get white praise, academics love to seek white praise from their white supervisors, and it's crazy, because I can stand here now and honestly say, white people don't care about you actually, and white people are not your friends. That, that, that never exists. And, I, and actually, I include myself in that, you know. People who know me, I think there may be a few students who know me here, they know that I don't believe I'm a better wife, there's no such thing. And there's a, there's a lovely theolog theologian called James Kuhn, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. He speaks about white, whites, he says, whites do not so much about racial justice because they are not prepared for a radical redistribution of wealth and power. No group gives up power freely. I want to say that last sentence again, no group gives up power freely. You know, black man, you are on your own, let's, let's be clear. And uh, he also speaks about people like me who are often referred to as progressive whites. Oh my gosh, I hate that title, but if I belong there, possibly, yes. And he says, what, progressive whites are just as bad because they don't mind speaking as long as it does not cost much, as long as the structures of power remain intact. So. You have no white friends, trust me. <laughs> on the issue of um, on the issue of uh, co-option, because which I think is something that happens in universities a lot. There was a historian called uh, uh, one of my favourite historians. I don't know if he's dead actually. I don't know. But anyway, Chomsky is he alive? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I kind of see would know. Actually, he's quite revolutionary, I think. And he speaks about how academics are co-opted into the system. And I've put on uh, two quotes, how uh, black academics in particular are put on pay uh, payrolls as consultants, how their research is funded, how the think tanks are organized to shape and dis disseminate the, the, the dominant narrative. And what we do see, we see if we look at the think tanks, that call themselves black in this country, 
and even attached to universities or not, they're just doing the work of white business. So we need to ask why. He, there's a lovely quote from him. He says that in 1972, one of the US judges, we had a big debate about our judiciary and how fair it is, um, how this judge wrote a, a memo to the US Chamber of Counsel and said the same, by the top academic reputations in the country to add credibility to corporate studies and to give business a stronger voice on the campuses. So we need to ask ourselves who is owning our voice and our our academic ability. So I'm, I'm almost finished. I just want to summarize some things that I find problematic, both in terms of the structure of our society and then in the structure of the universities. One of the things that I find tragic in the story of never-ending white privilege is that we've normalized black poverty and we've normalized white wealth as, as if these are normal things of society. I wonder what our children and their children are going to think that this is a land that whites are always rich, yeah. blacks are always poor, rather than seeing that as a monster of, of history. So it, it really worries me that we're creating this normalization. The other thing that really worries me, and I think we should, these are the things that I think should be discussed at universities, is what, how could it happen that so many people have died for liberation in this country and we still don't have it, that this fight that we thought, okay, I can't include myself, I'm the oppressor, the fight, uh, of black people for economic liberation, for land and self-determination, has become nothing more than an everyday battle for service delivery. I mean, that is, that's sad. That's sad. So the fight for self-determination has to be put up here on, in all senses, intellectually, economically, everything. We cannot have reduced this to a battle for electricity. It's insane, actually. And uh, these are questions I would expect university students to raise all the time. So we speak about the curriculum being controlled by white interests in the universities, but the real thing is the curriculum of South Africa is being controlled by white interests. And that is a, that's not an opinion, that's a fact, that's a state of being. The thing I wanted to speak briefly about was this mythical world of saints and sinners that I, I don't see at the students and academics um, querying enough, and I do think it speaks to the issue of decolonization. So I've been fascinated that we've had white journalists writing books about the, our previous um, uh, president, President Zuma. Whether you like him or not, I, I couldn't care less. But they write about a former president as the enemy of the state. Now I'm thinking, white man writing about a former president as the enemy of the, of the people. How does this be? Like, yeah. did he steal land? Did he kill people? No. Did he steal anything? Well, the courts have yet to show anything. But we are so we are so ready to accept a white man's version of um, history. The same thing happened with, um, and I'm sorry I missed the public protectors discussion, which I heard was very lovely. Um, she's also being demonized, by the way, and I'm not seeing academics or students coming and, and saying, this is a beautiful, brilliant black woman that we are defending. No, people are actually taking the side of whites against her. So what we see is we see a cover. I actually felt sick when I saw this. A cover on the financial mail saying, enemy of the state. And they demonized her. I don't know who saw that cover. She was like black and like a devil with big red, purple lipstick. But none of us object to that because we accept that as the norm. And these are things we, if we don't fight against, then actually perhaps we deserve to be forever colonized. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing. So the saint and uh, sinner thing, you know, and then we have the same thing where we've got people like Praveen because people like him and he's sweet and whatever that, I don't know, I, I don't think he's sweet, I think he's dreadful. But people think that he is, uh, I don't know, but he's now, he and Ramaphosa and all these likable um, white monopoly capital leaders, you can't say anything about them, they are seen as the saints of society. So I think we must be very careful who we're seeing as sinners and who we're seeing as saints. Because one day I think we're going to create a, a history and maybe it's even going to be told in universities that the Guptas took land away from people in South Africa. 
and that there was not and that apartheid was better than what we have today. And I don't think these things are going to these are far fetched. Um, I'm pretty old. I worked many years ago at a newspaper called the Sowetan, uh, under probably one of the most wonderful men I've ever met, Dr. Agri Claster. You may be too young to know him. Yeah. And one of the people that worked with us was the, the, a famous South African, Don Matera, who I hope you all have heard of. Yeah. And he's a beautiful poet. Um, I was always very intimidated to, to see him, and he was a very, very radical man. And he did a, he's written a beautiful book, I think it's called Azanian Love Songs. Yes. Do you know? Yes. Correct. Now, do you know that this book was rejected by the Department of Education as being part of the syllabus? Because it, were, it may, and I saw the quote, it could upset white children. Wow. So, I mean, these are problematic things. Then I think I saw our Minister of Education the other day saying that they may be introducing Biko's book into the syllabus. Am I right? Did I see it properly? But I mean, for 25 years, if we haven't had Biko's book in the syllabus, what kind of government is this? This is a whitewash of history. Because I can tell you, the solution to this country lies in that book. A black consciousness unfettered by this reconciliation nonsense. And that is decolonization. And until we have that in our syllabus, I don't know that there's much to talk about. And students and academics should be fighting that that's not on the shelf, but that center, it's the key text. I mean, every single kid in this country should read Steve Biko's book. We would be a very different nation. Finally, I'm getting to my last two pages, and uh, I think I have a thing about uh, Franz Fanon, but he speaks about how the oppressed always believe the worst in themselves, and that's why I think there needs to be like a uh, decolonization of, of the mind, I'm afraid to say, because the trauma of apartheid and colonialism has really damaged people. I mean, we, we really believe that white people are still superior, actually, and that's terrifying. Yeah. Because white people believe that, and black people believe it, so, sure, it's not, not a good situation. And he speaks about how you have to take the germs of imperialism, not only out of our land, but out of our minds. We have a government, I tell you now, they will never, never, never take land away from whites. They won't. And I think we need to make sure that that does happen. And then finally is the expropriation of the thinking space. That, own it again, I mean, we don't have black think tanks. There's no investment in black thought. Um, there's, it's, it's crazy, you know, to keep mimicking a system that actually hates you and, and doesn't honor you, and that's a white-based system. So, yeah, after my lecture, that's, I hope I've given some uh, useful uh, insights, and I look forward to any questions later. And thank you for listening to me. Our fourth speaker for this session is someone who doesn't need any introduction. And he's the chairperson of the annual student law conference. So he's one of the person who made it sure that we are gathered here today. The speaker is Mr. David Letswano. David Letswano is a law academic in the College of Law at UNISA. He is an activist and a pro proponent of black solidarity and champions the interest of blacks in various spaces in our lives. He holds strongly to Africanist and black consciousness views. I think something that's missing on the bio, which I want to indicate is that he's also a deputy president of the Black Forum Movement. Thank you, yes. Mr. David Litzwano, you can come forward. A lady from a rural village in Limpopo, in the Zanin area. And I'm going to say it in short, and I think this will sort of carry the essence of what we are about to do in this kind of ceremony. And she says, and that is Mabula Nisena, but I haven't met her. 
She says, I am a dark skinned, and for the longest time, I was not comfortable in this tone. I wished I was a bit lighter. I hated comments like, uh, you know, you look so African. I still get this comment, and now my response is, I look African because I am African. And I'm proud of my African identity. My parents are the root cause of all this confidence I display now, and I appreciate them for that. I'm dark, highly concentrated in melanin, and I love the way I look. Unfortunately for some children, they are mocked even at home by their own parents. And as soon as they get funds to change their looks for a more normal society, they bleach. So skin whitening, as you refer to as cultural violence, can be stopped or reduced when Africans become proud of their African identity and start embracing their young, dark skinned from a young age so that they grow up feeling worthy and not create a need in them to look lighter. That's a heart-wrenching story about uh, skin whitening. And you will understand later on why I'm referring to this uh, analogous story. But anyway, why are we gathered here this morning and indeed start to spend the whole day predominated by the subject of curriculum transformation, Africanization or decolonization as reflected in your program? I'm talking about a discourse in an African country in the year 2019, in a nameless country, South Africa. 25 years into a black-faced government. I must immediately point out that this is a shame, abomination, if not an aberration, for any African or any African academic worth their identity and pride. I am not too hopeful that we shall Africanize the curriculum in our lifetime. At the rate we are going, Curriculum transformation will remain just a scholarly subject matter or a professional portfolio in a Euro-American or pan-European academy. I will point out why in the course of my presentation. All these remarks I have made point to the issue of white power, white supremacy, and the arrogance that follows in the world view of white power, uh, King. In the world view of white power and conquest, the black does not exist. And if it does exist, it is a condition of condemnation or subhumanity. I don't want to refer to Fano one night. So what do you expect from a condemned non-being? What do you expect from a nothing? So those are serious questions because they speak to the curriculum and why we don't have African epistemologies. So if Africans are a nothing, what do you expect from them? So in the world of white supremacy, therefore, Africans did not leave they simply existed. In other ways, they had no knowledge, no languages, no science, no jurisprudence, no culture, no economy, no mind. And this is what the agenda of colonialism has been. That is physical, mental, and spiritual genocide. Hence, the notion of epistemicide and linguisticide are instructive. Through mental colonization or whitening of the black mind, we find ourselves immersed in a perceptive state 
of Eurocentric standards as a frame of reference in our approaches. That is why we even expect the same colonizers to help us decolonize ourselves and Africanize our curriculum. And that's the power of witchcraft. <laughs> for, a, for a long time, the decolonization project of school in the, in the humanities at Tunisia was spearheaded by a, a, a white professor who was uh, decolonizing our professor. <laughs> so, I don't want to comment about, about you, Professor Green. You're holding a portfolio of uh, curriculum transformation in the College of Law, but you're okay. <laughs> so, it is important at this stage that I make the lamentable assertion that this country is a society that is predominated by MTT and uninterrogated concepts. I do not think we as academics, black academics in particular, are doing enough to critique this dimension. The discourse of curriculum transformation has ignited my mind to think deeply about this calamitous state of affairs. For instance, and Kuda, I'm happy that you mentioned this point. The concept transformation is one of those ambiguous, if not ambivalent and non-committal terms that have really delayed and derailed the mission or efforts to give our education the African face, soul, and character. Transformation can mean anything as it really means the changing of the form of something. Transform, we change the form of a particular thing. In other ways, you keep the thing and rather simply modify or change its form. So the monster in the house is not exterminated. It remains in the house are they in another form. It's not deleted or destroyed. Thus, the character of the devil is not tempered with. Only its appearance is given an appealing conformist face -out. So you're not dealing with the character of the devil, but you're giving the, the devil some appeasing, comfortable face -lift. In simple terms, a Eurocentric or colonial curriculum is still sustained while wrapped in ostensible new clothes. That's the story of the last 25 years of our education. Decolonization, on the other hand, simply refers to a process of washing away the debt of colonization. But it, it is not pointed in terms of what to do after the cleansing. So here we are talking about the process without articulating uh, what I would refer to as a distinct point of that process. It's like you are involved in a battle without a game plan. So you can decolonize and decolonize, but what, you, what is your end game? So the notion of Africanization therefore touches my soul. So in my space, I don't talk about curriculum transformation. I talk about curriculum Africanization. Decolonize, yes, but with the idea that the destination is Africanization. Yes. So, Africanization unambiguously directs one unapologetically to locate oneself in the realm of Afrocentricity. However, Afrocentric approaches imply that as academics we should go to the 
unadulterated African epistemology. It sets an agenda for us to travel cognitively and spiritually to Africa, to Kemet, to the pre-colonial Africa. I long to return to the cozy womb of Mother Africa. That is what I long for. To return to that comfortable womb of Mother Africa. Whilst on this Africa, allow me to pause and pose a reflective rhetoric question to you. So that people like answering rhetoric questions. I'm telling you, I am posing this reflective rhetoric question. We sometimes ask ourselves what we really mean every time we shout, why do we? We just join in. And even some white people joining us in the rally is my boy. When are we going to get the space of shouting, Liboyi? We don't have that imagination. Yeah. So it boggles my mind when a black leader or a black president shouts in front of his people. As a leader or president, why don't you just bring it back? Because you are in power. So every time I hear this mic, we are looking at who you are. If you are in power, or if you are affiliated to those who are supposed to be in power, I just feel like it's insane. It is. Because you just have to voice it, yes. retain it. Mm. And I always say that when you are in power, use your power. So when you are given the space to be uh, something, you know, make sure that you use your capacity. Yeah. Because the minute you are kicked out of that portfolio, you will regret that you didn't use your opportunity when you had it. So the concept of my Buye Africa is very important when dealing with curriculum transformation because it behoves on us to retain African content, African values, and African character to our curriculum. In this phrase, e Africa is a comprehensive, is as, in, as, is as comprehensive as it is inclusive. When you say Africa, we're not referring to the geographical map as it is. The Africa includes that physical geographical space, the knowledge, the culture, the languages, the epistemology, the environment, the economy, the identity, and so on and so on and so on. So every time when you say my way Africa, you must understand that you mean a lot of things. My Buye, the Africa. Buye from where? And this part of the question, Mkuli, you touched it, although I didn't ask you to do it. Because this part of the question unavoidably relates to the fact that Africa has been taken away from us. Our epistemology and science have been stolen from us or the covert curriculum of the post-1994 Africa, South Africa is. I don't know whether we have started engaging the see, but okay. What is the covert curriculum or the underlying philosophy of the post-1994 hegemon? My view is that it is a wishy-washy notion steeped in a rainbow confusion. It is far from being geared towards producing an African rooted citizenry or nation. Unfortunately, this rainbow nonsense has been made supreme via the 1996 Rainbow Constitution. Thus, we cannot expect to Africanize our curriculum through the use of this overrated constitution. So, given this dilemma that I have hopefully painted, 
What is the way forward? I submit that education, again, I want to emphasize that, is not neutral. If you say I must design a curriculum for white children, as me, from Africa, what do you think I will put in their curriculum? Of course. I will put poison. <laughs> so that I can direct them to the destined route. Of course. So if you have white people design the curriculum for you, what do you expect them to, <laughs> to do? <laughs> they will destine you to a particular point that they have specified in their minds. So I submit that we should raise fundamental questions unapologetically. And I'm serious about these questions, uh, Mafia. One, do we have a political leadership with the will to do better? To declare war on white supremacy? I'm not talking about to declare war on whites. I'm talking about to declare war on white supremacy. Because what we are engaged with here, the whole issue of curriculum transformation, is about white supremacy. Kim talked about it, Mpuni talked about it. Number two, do we have the academia that realizes that Africanization is a state of emergency? So, when ESCOM goes bust, it becomes a state of emergency and something's done. And now I see the whole issue of gender-based violence. It's a state of emergency. Something is done. And I see that some envoys who, are, who would be sent throughout Africa for addressing an emergency situation. But the fundamental serious emergency case is the education of our nation. 25 years, there has not been any sign that the issue of curriculum Africanization is a case for state of emergency. So I want to declare today by the powers vested in me and the president of Azania ah. <laughs> that education and Africanization thereof is a state of emergency. So going forward, we must start thinking around this issue. Because we are where we are, thinking as children instead of adults, as we could have said, because of this very same education. The whole issue of being scared of whiteness is because of the education that we have here. The whole thing of setting up, setting out and aligning yourself with your own enemies against your own black agenda is the result of this education. All these problems that we have fighting against one another as black people is because of how we have been taught, how we have been raised. The divisions. Even at the student level, we are predominated by divisions. At adult political level, divisions. Can you imagine if all Africans, particularly in Azania, were united? The level of law being retained in the hands of the rightful owners. A lot of social issues would have been addressed, but we are still arguing amongst ourselves because. And, you know, we have to respect the colonizers and white people. They know how to get the recipe of dividing black people. And it is a weapon that they've used, you know, predictively over the years. It's a template that they don't depart from. Yet we don't catch the vibe. <laughs> Number three. Who should Africanize the curriculum, actually? Can anyone Africanize the curriculum? No. 
what type of academic can or should Africanize? Can we expect the beneficiaries of white or American academy to Africanize? So the reality is that if I, Af if I Africanize and my being and profile is derived from Eurocentric education, I'm rendering myself useless and irrelevant. Yeah. With all my certificates, it means I must put them on fire and be start afresh like everybody else. So it is wrong to expect that people like us in the universities, blacks, white, in the academia, it is, I think it is far fetched that to expect us to Africanize. Because we have been made by the very same system and we benefit from it. I'm standing here before you because I, I went through the Eurocentric system. Without my certificate from white universities, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. And that's a very, very big question. We don't qualify, all of us who are in these academic spaces, to Africanize because we are contaminated. Yeah. Oh. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion, and which could actually have a little bit earlier. In other words, can we entrust curriculum to Africanization in the hands of colonized academics, for instance? What do you expect from a colonized academic? And I like referring to uh, this point about various types of academics, which uh, the late uh, Dr. Kenneth Tafira refers to. He identified nine types of academics our intellectuals, nine, but I'm interested only in a few. The first one that is advocating or suggesting is the African revolutionary intellectual. And I think this kind of academics that is the kind of ideal academic that we should all aspire to be. And this one is, is looking at academia as a space for insurgency in favor of a pan-African or Afrocentric agenda. But then there's a colonized intellectual Whose, mood, whose main motive is to pursue the agenda of his or her masters. He perpetuates the white agenda. Obviously, they have what is referred to as a coward. A coward at academic. He doesn't feature anywhere. He doesn't oppose anything. He doesn't contribute anything, whether from the left or the right. He's just there. He avoids risky situations. And then there is one he referred to as an opportunist. That one blows with the wind. If the, the systemic arrangements go this way, he's there. And if they turn this way, he's there. So such an academic, as an opportunist academic, is as dangerous as the colonized academic. So those are the ones that are interesting me more. But then we have to deal with to Africanize. But we have a dilemma. Who should Africanize? And secondly, and which is a tragedy, there has always been a concern for you know out based outcomes based education, you know content and you know. the critical player in the education sphere is the educator because he's the one who set out the objectives 
and is the one who is selecting the content. So an anti-African academic will select a content that will push the agenda of anti-Africanism. And it will also set the goals that will pursue that very same agenda. So we must work towards the idea of conscientization as far as possible to make sure that the people interested in conducting our academic exercises are the ones who are alive to the fact that there is a need to execute a political mandate which is to Moisa in Africa. So, as I go towards my conclusion, because of our failure to be frank, I wish I could be as frank as Kim. So you qualify to be among a list of a few white friends that I have. <laughs> Because you're frank, so you qualify. So today you've got a qualification. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be frank about these questions. So and we unfortunately find this college busy doing a roundabout thing, and I'm being frank about this. The College of Law. In, in, in their attempt, feeble attempt, I must say, to transform or Africanize, we are doing a, a roundabout thing which is far from the Africanization agenda. We are wasting time, actually. What we do when we say we are transforming the curriculum is to write a few paragraphs in a study guide on Ubuntu even if you don't know what Ubuntu is. I saw some white colleagues in, in, in my, my department, you know, writing this study and then saying something about Ubuntu. And I ask, who is the other Ubuntu? <laughs> For most people who are not African, Ubuntu is about telling the other chief. You don't see color. You see the, the child of God. Are not different. I see you, I see the image of God. And that is Ubuntu. But Ubuntu goes deeper than that. It's about taking responsibility. When as a family man or a woman, your household is attacked and you fail to take appropriate action to defend your household, you are not practicing Ubuntu. So we can go on, on and on and on about the question of Ubuntu. So we must not check our responsibilities and entrust the teaching of African values, systems, Ubuntu to people who have got no clue about what Ubuntu is. Transform through a constitution. You must be using the correct tool, the correct appropriate constitution to transform. So we must first deal with the constitution to say, is this constitution pro-African or is it anti-African? Then we can start saying, yes, now we can embark on transformative constitutionalism because we know the constitution will help us. So this document that we have here will not create an Africanized curriculum. So for many years, we're going to be stuck with this thing. And I know as long as time goes on, we're delayed, it doesn't work in the favor of the African masses. The status quo is simply maintained and sustained through transformative constitutionalism and things like that, you know, so on and so on. So, unless we arrest this situation, we're going to be singing this song for a long, long, long time. One of the things that I thought I would realize or see is in my lifetime. And I, I remember saying this to the Black Consciousness Movement uh, gathering around 
I think around the 16 in prisons. And I said, the African bloc, the Azanian bloc in our political space should unite and push for the realization of Azania. Because we have seen the 1994 transition, those of us who are lucky to be there, we have seen it and it's nothing. The excitement was just a simple euphoria. Then we are also lucky to see the 2010 World Cup. Well, nothing, like nothing. But I would like, uh, before we depart this day, some of us, we should have experienced this country having its identity, having a name, the name Azani. So for me, if I experience the renaming of this country into Azania in my lifetime, I think I would depart peacefully. Yeah. So that's why it only took the the kingdom of SOT to like without no explanations, excuses and courts and things were changing the kingdom of SOT. Mm. I can assure you if you were to embark on a project of renaming or naming actually naming this country as a name, we're going to take about five years in the courts, more especially the constitutional court. We have even failed to rename the court. We've got a station for Mahatma Gandhi in Pretoria. So in this regard, in conclusion, uh, my Africa colleagues in the College of Law, the in UNISA generally, the college can help itself by the following. Professor, this is my submission. And I'm serious about it, and I think we should take note. Because I made the argument that we who are in the inside are complicit by default, perhaps, we are contaminated, we have got vested interest in the Eurocentric system. We should outsource the Africanization agenda to bodies such as the Zinzi Mandela Foundation, the Indigenous African People's Forum, and many other committed organizations that deal with issues of Africanization without any apology. I must say this again. Because we who are in the inside are the beneficiaries of the very same system, we are made by the very same system, we cannot be entrusted with destroying the very same thing that we are benefiting from. Therefore, let us outsource this thing to people who are clearly, clearly having the mandate and mission to, to Africanize, not even to sing the songs of transformation, to Africanize. Number two, we must free academics from white tutelage. This thing of Black academics being supervised all the time by white professors. It's not on. It's not on. And then this student was allocated. This student negotiated with a fellow white lecturer to say, I want to move from you. So the white lecturer colleague had to come to, in my presence, had to come to my colleague to say, Do you know students so and so? He said, the man said, Yes. I wonder whether I could actually take over from you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was present. I can assure you that if I was not there, the, 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 the colleague was going to agree. Yeah. I said in front of the white person, no, it can't be. He is fit to supervise this white student. And that was the end of the story. Why is it important to make sure that we get black supervisors. Actually, conscious black supervisors. Mm. It's because we are doing damage. That is why you see students who don't have confidence in 
in their black lecturers. They are very much comfortable to be in the company of white professors and white academics. They don't believe that white academic, uh, black academics can actually assist them. If they can, then there will be, it will be a substandard kind of work. So we are damaging young black men by so doing. So all the symptoms that we see around where students are teaming up with anti-black agendas is because of this kind of thing. Getting affirmation from whiteness all the time. Number three, we must stop expecting that white people will decolonize. Of course. Stop that nonsense. Of course. The same thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the political struggle. And I'm happy that Kim is here and I'm going to stop her to speak frankly. We appreciate that you can contribute to discourse on how we can... Okay, let me just speak to this uh, very, very briefly. It was wrong, right from the start, to start what is called the Republic of South Africa. They have no right and mandate to balkanize Umshaba Wamakos and put them under what is called the Republic of South Africa. So, for us to dismantle things, we have to start right there. Ababwas Tole, Abatolu Mshabawa. Ababwa Makado, Abatolu Mshabawa. Then we then sit down and say, how do we accommodate people that are from outside? Moba Nabo, they've got to adopt an African culture and an African language for them to exist on this continent. So, Tina, we've done it the other way around, where we are accommodating our visitors in our own country. So if we are to be truthful in addressing our problems that face African people, we have to deal. Because that problem didn't start in South Africa, right from Kwame Nkrumah. Um, Kwame Nkrumah allowed them, or they balkanized before him, but he then carried on and continued where white people uh, you know, say, you know, uh, left. So it damaged. It's not only here, right from Kumkwame Nkrum. Yes, sir. We still suffer the same thing today. So it's very dangerous, Venatesha, because of that, you can't trust the moon. Especially Mundo Lambi. Very easily tempted by materialism. How do we deal with the of professors? Hey, yes. That's a very difficult one because in the struggle we knew exactly how to deal with the Israel. Yes. But now because of your Galendolensis is to be the we have an idea of what is for me. Because the struggle is still on. It's not yet Uhuru. Those who betray us, we must take a decision collectively as to how we deal with them. Because they are the enemy of the progress. Those who are, you know, uh, spearheading a revolution. You should speak in front of them so that they know that from today, this is the decision we are taking. Whoever betrays this, they should follow. That's the only thing because he misremember very that made us lose power. Hey. Then, uh, Kesha, there's a book by George James uh, called The Stolen Legacy. Yes. That is the book that will, you know, give you a, a researched and scientific information how these Romans and, you know, Greeks plagiarized to form what is called Western civilization with something that doesn't exist at all because Laban and Laban were taught by us they were supposed to then trade the source 
so people can, you know, get that book to clarify that. Then when it comes to the constitution, you know, African constitution, who oh, Professor Shikhan Tadjok, who is my, you know, leader, a person that has used the information and knowledge he got from these white institutions, you know, to, he used that knowledge to, to, to seek the root going back home and to give us Tina Izulwan the scientific basis to argue this white supremacy. So Ushi Khanta Diop should be introduced, should be the first person that we introduce his books because there's no other person better than Ushi Khanta Diop that has given us scientific information, you know, and, and, and knowledge for us to actually correct, you know, this anomaly. Then there's the concept of Ma'at, the 42 confessions. Uh, Ma'at is like Ubuntu in its original form. Before it was messed up and they, you know, be used by all sorts of people. Ma'at meaning that um, uh, everything that you do, you are doing it consciously, knowing that whatever I'm doing, it has got to create harmony and balance. Not only on the physical, but spiritual. My actions, because Uma Ati Nati Ile Nesebi Zunem Beza When the Indo Ebi, you don't show it to me, but you feel it. You won't show it to me, but you feel it. So, you you strive, or Koko Bet, you strive, even uh, you know, in terms of structure in the government and the society itself, it was all to do with the balance. You know, um, uh, as one of uh, their idioms says, you know, as above, so is below. You know, it was a continuous pursuit of that balance. Because once there's balance, I normally say to people, look at it, when there's a resonance between heaven and earth, then magic comes out of that. So, meaning what you, younger Indo Oyenza, try and make sure what you create that balance. You know, for the decision, you put it now, Undombazane, we are sure. If you were not brought up by the principles of my art, whereby every morning and every night before you sleep, there are 42 principles called the, the principles of my art that you have to, in yourself, confess what I have not raped, I have not committed this, I have... So, that was the general or the foundation of Africans' constitution. That is why there was harmony in Africa, because we are guided by the principles of Ma'at. Shoguti u Ma'at principle reigned supreme in every aspect of our lives. That is why we never, you know, needed to be policy or Sifagama prisons. You've never heard to go to Africa in prisons because we had our own way of dealing, you know, with the character that has actually lost, you know, uh, in care. So, if we are to reintroduce the constitution yet, it has to be based on Uma Art. And uh, that is the subject that still needs to be taught to most of the people because uh, by understanding, they don't know it. All they know, it's a bastardized version currently of Ubuntu. Thank you for a very informative as I said, I stood up here as a white settler, as a foreigner, as someone who shouldn't be here. 
and talk face with, with very difficult questions. And I want to answer this in a, a variety of ways. First of all, if, if I had to give up everything, every, fi every financial thing in my being, every financial asset I had, I would still remain privileged. And I think that's something we need to understand. Well, if, I, if I walk into yeah. a room, I'm yeah. seen differently. A very good friend of mine recently was hospitalized at Steve Biko, uh, which is a public hospital, and I went to see him. I could see how I got access as a white woman. I wasn't questioned. I don't know if people thought I was a doctor or that I wasn't just somebody trying to get, get in. The way they treated a black woman just be, behind me was so different because I could get access into different situations. In terms of privilege, I, I was born privileged, I am privileged and I'll die privileged whether I have my material goods or not. I have made and there may be people even in this room who know the, the financial sacrifices, let me not even say that, amendments, yeah. uh, adjustments. Um, but I cannot get rid of my privilege and I never will. And it's a question that I've asked the white society is, uh, I've written extensively about the fact that white people do not have a moral conscience uh, because we have had multiple opportunities to come to the table and say, what do we do about land? What do we do about these situations? And white people will, te will treat poverty as if it's a pedestrian somewhere else, but it's, it's not as if it's not created by themselves. I have had extensive discussions with senior, very wealthy white business people who are not interested in um, giving away any privilege. I think what whites do very well is they pursue self-interest uh, and that they will not let that go. So uh, people who have land, I don't have land, people who have got vast amounts of land in land trusts, I've approached and I've said, give this back, give this back, and they won't. So, I mean, we have to almost impose, we have to assume that white people do not have a moral conscience. Because we have 25 years, we've had a chance to give things back and we haven't. So we have to impose it upon them, actually. We have to do, we have, land has to be taken without compensation. You don't take back a car that's been stolen and you discuss conditions. Um, that, has to, that has to happen. It, it, they, but, but it's more than that. Um, it, it, there's opportunities, I mean, the opportunity privilege, the walking into a Steve Biko hospital and just getting there, the, the, the way that I'm treated at the service counter of any shop right checkers is different. It's those kind of things that I hold on to. You know, I, I um, uh, Zinzi Mandela, who's one of my heroes, and I'm sure she is here, she, had, she wrote a comment about land which caused this drama. White people got very reactive. And I came out in support of her uh, tweet and I went on to uh, ENCA and actually I did this thing that, that trended, maybe some of you saw it, where I said, I sit here as a white, as a child of privilege, like every single other white person in this country, and today, tomorrow, and yesterday, and I'm never going to be, I'm never going to be able to get rid of that privilege. Um, and, that's, and that's a fact. But we can, there can be certain things done, like um, land must be taken, that's first and foremost. And I've written an article uh, where I've said, Dear white South Africans, it's time to give back the land. And I've said, actually, the humanity of black people in this country is vast, because you are being inhumane. But it's a sign of their humanity that they're still asking you to, have, to be in debates on the land. It's crazy. There's, but white people will show no sign. I can tell you, white people in this country, I do not believe, have got any interest in changing anything. They want to hold on to their privilege. And, uh, and I think we need to have things like the reparation uh, conference. In fact, I'd like to speak to certain people about here. How do we enforce reparation? And why I don't want to deal... Like, uh, what I've done in my life is not reflective. I'm, I, certainly, and I've also had a choice. I, I'm privileged enough to have a choice to say, I've got this, this that I can then give to somebody else. And it doesn't make me any better, actually, than any other white person. 
and I can do it, you know, I always speak about white people as hobbyist activists, but we can do, I, I think the reparation fund is critical, and I think white people have to be dealt with collectively. There may be one or two better white people who, who've done things for whatever reason, I don't know uh, the concept of a better white, I'm not sure of, but the TRC never, never dealt with whites, and never dealt with white complicity. So I think um, we have to look at the, at, at the system, like whiteness as a whole, there's a group of white, uh, white people, actually every white person in this country needs to be accountable for this. So I think we shouldn't be treating people individually. We should be treating people collectively. And I mean, there, there was talk about a tax, an apartheid tax. There was talk about uh, retribution. And because white people won't do that willingly, it should be done in a forced basis. Um, I mean, in my own life, I'm. I, I think I've pushed my resources where I think I can. I mean, my financial situation is totally different to, to what it was 100 years ago. Uh, you know, in this country, you're prejudiced if you speak against privilege, for instance. So I, um, I was taken out, I, I'd actually got a, a very good job offer uh, in a corporate space, but I was a known EFF member and an ANC parliamentary person made sure I didn't get that job. So I think uh, all I can say is that when, we, when there are a few of us that speak out against privilege, we are dealt with very severely. Yes. And, uh, and that's another thing that is problematic. Uh, yeah. I have a, I have a, a, a friend in New York, uh, African-American, she's actually South African, but she's living there and she's an activist in New York, and she says she cannot understand the lack of tolerance that we have in this country, that if you don't go with it, typical narrative, how badly punished you are. But I think, just in conclusion, land must be taken. That will humble white people. There's nothing else that's going to humble white people <laughs> than taking land. So... When you listen to a question, try to separate the question, the factual question, from the emotions and the passion with which the question is posed. Now I can respond. Comrade Tab, <laughs> I like the passion. <laughs> However, listening to everything that you are saying, I wish you were co-presenting the paper with me because you were agreeing, repeating everything that I was saying in my in my presentation, word for word, almost. And I'm very much proud of you. The, the basic thing that I'd like to add in response is where you say that I don't go beyond curriculum uh, Africanization to get into the changing of the institution. My, my presentation was actually doing not only that which you are complaining about, I can go beyond that to say that we must take a systemic approach to these things. I even went on to say that we are not going to be able to do this whole project if we don't have a revolutionary African government. It is the role of the revolutionary government to, to make sure that the institutions told the life. So I, I want to, to agree and uh, praise you for, for, for putting yourself in that particular kind of space. Then there was a, okay, the whole issue of decolonization. We should decolonize, yes. But I made an important point that decolonization without the game plan, which is Africa, will not help us. When you conduct a, a war, you must have a game plan. Because you can achieve all the gains in the battlefield, but when everything else is said and done, you go back to zero, and you don't maximize on what you achieved on the battlefield. So decolonization without African content, character, and soul uh, might actually be uh, meaningless. 
So as we decolonize, we must have the idea that the, the ultimate goal is to wisdom in Africa. And in short, we must waste time. Why don't we go straight to the core and Africanize? And instead of saying transformation, change, and decolonization, if you say Africanization, you have solved everything. It's a package. Which brings me to an interesting question from, <laughs> from my brother, uh, uh, Tando. I don't know why you asked that question. <laughs> but uh, there was also emotion there, so I chose to separate the Pashe from, from, <laughs> from the, the factual question you asked. Uh, I mean, you, you, know, you know me and uh, you know what I stand for. And the program director introduced me in a proper way about the, what directs my, 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 my life. So, I'm here in a university space which I'm benefiting from. And I said that much to say people like us are complicit. Nkulu can come and see here and say what you wanted to say, wanted me to say in clear. And the, the, the chairperson of the annual school law committee standing here uh, saying what you want me to say in the way in which you say it uh, might, might not actually do it because like uh, all these people are privileged by the system I'm part of them however and in any case I'm going to give you what you want when I'm talking about white supremacy you mustn't lose sight of the fact that white supremacy is a monstrous thing. It's a massive thing. It's a comprehensive thing. So whites are part of white supremacy. Whiteness as a concept is part of the spider web, which is white supremacy. I'm happy that uh, uh, Advocate Moruta asked a question uh, about witchcraft and the, the killing of witches. And then he ascribed that to me. And that should actually give you a direction of how we deal with what supremacy. But there's another point that I want you to take care of my brother. To say that white supremacy is not constructed and sustained by white people alone. There are also black people who are building and creating and sustaining white supremacy. Actually, they do it more than white people themselves, as Moruta indicated. They volunteer without being asked to create and build and sustain white supremacy. So, when you deal with white supremacy, you mean you're, you're killing the system, the, white, the, the supremacy itself, the spider web, with all that is around it. So I don't, I don't think there's a, another question. I don't think I have three questions. Is that fine? Oh yes. Yes. There is a question from uh, our, our invited guest, uh, Brother Kulani Du. Uh, I'm happy that you asked it as a as an invited guest because uh, it shows that you. You want to understand what is happening inside. In other words, you have, you have no idea of what is happening. This conference is the conference of the College of Law or the Faculty of Law at UBS. It's not an institutional uh, conference. So the student formations or structures that automatically would be part of this conference would be those that speak to the law faculty. So you'd have your, your, your ULSA, you'd have your BLA, you'd have your Madel, and I think they're all here. But now I can volunteer to say that who we are uh, in the progressive circles of the university, particularly from the view of the platform, we are paid by what you are concerned about the division amongst our people. 
That is why the motto of the Black Forum is to advance black solidarity. So we are pained by the separatism that is being created and uh, ignited by the opponents of the black agenda. So, outside the College of Law, we are working very hard to make sure, in our program, to make sure that when we, we invite or we involve in in our activities, we, 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 are, we, we go across the board. And for your information, the executive of the Black Forum is interesting, is made up of people from across. So we have the PAC members, we have got the Black Consciousness Movement, we have got the ANC, Staunch ANC, we have got EFF, and so on and so on. We are looking for an Ikata uh, uh, Freedom Party executive member. So I wish one day we have uh, one. But in general, there's no problem uh, with, with, with us here. So once we organize something that is institutional, we are, we are comprehensive, we are inclusive, because it's not in the character of us to instill divisions. In fact, we are very much hurt. I mean, the, the past few weeks or months were bedeviled and seized with this issue of anti-black forces trying to separate our people. We'll do anything possible to make sure that our people get united at high political and student formation level. I want to thank you. Transformation. For as long as we don't speak our languages. Because to decolonize or to write the law is rooted in our languages. So effectively it says no white South African or any foreign white can participate in the rewriting of anything African or South African because they don't speak our language. <laughs> Two, we can't ask any African to participate in the decolonization project or transformation or rewriting of the law or anything if those Africans have not gone back 13 centuries ago. We were colonized in 642 yeah. by the Arabs. In 1400, white people took over from the Arabs. If you count it 13 centuries, 1300 years ago, if you don't know what happened here 1300 years ago, what are you talking about when you say we must be colonized from this to this? Because you don't even know who you are. Which is the reason why we have Africans use the phrase witch doctor, Babonfu, with a straight face. What is the witch doctor? Um, people say me at Tulana, so I'll try not to. I'll say so Tulana is just one. A witch doctor is a bullshit concept. It never existed in our culture. In our language, you are either a doctor or a witch. Umuloi yeah. or Umaka. We never know who is that. There is no one who is that. But since Christianity is now wanted you to believe that everything spiritual in Africa is demonic. So they made you believe if you need Nyama, but I can't. That's why you don't consult them. Now, if you have not gone back 13 centuries ago, please don't be involved, Professor Kree, yeah. in rewriting anything after <laughs> The third revelation I got, it shocks me too, by the way, because it doesn't only speak, David, to rewriting of the law, it speaks to the education system as a whole. You see, I'm sitting here giving a, a, a revelation about Kuru Our thought processes, the Negroid race and the Caucasian race are diametrically opposed. The two don't meet. Remember, there are only three races on earth, the rest are nations. You mustn't confuse. You have the Caucasian race that's white. You have the Mongoloid race that's yellow people. You have the Negroid race that's us. Now, the thought processes of these races are not the same. I won't cover the Mongoloid race. I'll cover the Caucasian race because that's who we are fighting in South Africa. You see, and that affects why our kids don't make it at university. Because they are taught in a Caucasian way, meanwhile they are Negroid. Now, let me tell you the difference in the two thought processes. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow collapses into one. Because I am today, and the ancestors are yesterday, and the supreme being will come out of the is tomorrow. So for us, time is one. It is not that 
implement it. Now, if they teach you, you are going to fail because your mind negates the method or the way in which they are teaching you. Three, they go and say spirit versus better. And the two don't meet. But African spirituality is both scientific and spiritual. So us spirit and matter resides within one. The day you say spirit and matter are versus we are going to fail because we are being an African. We are negating the very core of your philosophy. The two are one for us. And then we go and we say collectivism. They go and they say similarity. You can see that by how they define the family. For us, it's collective. That is why most Africans do well in group work. But if you are going to test them as individuals, they fail because that's not how we are wired. We are a collective people. Yeah. So it means we need to even change the methods of testing in our universities and schools. <laughs> and then you see how white people behave in group work. They take over and be the singular person. Because that's how they are wired. They are happy to do good work for you, type it and edit it as an individual. That's how they are wired. They are not collective. And then we think in relative terms. We are not judgmental people. Do you know that? That is why homophobia is not African. You have been taught to be homophobic by Christianity and Islam. Yeah, we were never homophobic. Yeah, and we did have people who were not heterosexual. We did have people who were not Christian and heterosexual. But we never even gave them labels, that's why we don't even know their names because we are relative people, it wasn't an issue for us. Yeah. Now, they are not, they are absolute people. It's either this or it's this. That's why if war breaks out in South Africa, you must watch CIA tapes. When CIA sits and analyze that conflict, the first question they ask is, okay, who are the bad guys and who are the good guys? What if both are bad guys or both are good guys who are not in who are good at that time they are not understanding each other? We don't think like that we are relative people. So if you don't know all of this, how then do you go on and rewrite any curriculum, Professor Tree, or any white South African participate in writing any policy for Africans? For the principle of Ma'at, you talked about it on cool. But you know that Ma'at is the principle of material. Are you aware? Uh, let me bless the bubble yes. of all African beings. <laughs> we are not the head of any household in Africa. Sure. Again, you took that rubbish from Christianity yes. and from Islam. Yes. Yes. There's no head of any household in African culture. My aunt is a woman who holds the justice case of both men. Because African law and philosophy is based on material. Because yes. we believe that the in order for human beings to be on earth, the woman came first yes. because the woman then got pregnant and gave birth. Yes. So the woman, by right in African spirituality, is superior than the men. Yes. But because we think in relative terms, it is not oppressive. You can't understand matriarchy as the opposite of patriarchy. Then you are mistaken again. Matriarchy simply meant the womb in Nimba. Those who speak Muni languages, I don't know what it's called in Sutu. In Nimba, that is why a mother is a mother to everyone, not just your biological. Yes. In fact, as now, you can be biological in our language. Yes. Because umama, umama, as long as they have umama, 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 umama. My aunt also meant blood, which is why killing senseless is not allowed to be passed. Now we are drafting an African law, and we don't know that. <laughs> uh, we also say it's my aunt is matriarchal because of the earth. Because we believe that the mother and the earth are inseparable. That is why in traditional proper African culture, only women are allowed to till the land and plant. Because we believe planting is a process of giving birth. Yeah. So if men touch the soil, it will go barren. Yeah. Islam and Christianity came and told you African men we are lazy. That's where the stereotype comes from. That we are lazy. They say we are lazy. Go and till the soil. Let your women go and cook. You allow them our soil, it is more barren, I don't know than what. We yes. have the most barren land in the, in the whole world currently. It's not a job. Sure. There's no rain in Africa. We have never been people struggling with water. When we, the, the water people, that's why when you give birth, water breaks first. All women are water people. That's why so we can't. You can't rewrite our law if you don't know the fourth principle of Ma'at, which is naturally. That's why we had no jails. Because we were based on the restorative justice. You see today, if you rate me and I go to court, they say state 
investors must say, oh, but you didn't rate the states. <laughs> <laughs> like me. There's no restorative justice. For us, justice was dispensed only for Uta or yes. You came there, you faced me. Yes. And why you had no chance? It's because of this false principle of nature, yes. where the perpetrator had to come to terms with their crime right there in front of the whole community. Yes. And then we would give you community service or punishment. We had no chance and we survived because it was based on matriarchy. Yes. Not the patriarchy that they, they are even happy they have a nerve. They sentenced someone to 60 years in jail. Mm -hmm. and, and you, the law, you are happy. Mm -hmm. You allow people to go and run away for 60 years. We should start with all the lawyers and lock them up for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll cut it there, but David, this is a revelation. We can make well. something out of this on a day. I think I'm going to develop it. Keep on white supremacy and privilege. You know, I've said this to DLF when I was a journalist. <coughs> Sorry to let fall out. The only reason white privilege and white supremacy exist is because of black inferiority. Simple. You're not never going to ask them not to feel inferior. For as long as you speak their language, adopt their culture, where they are born. I mean, when you see a white pain, you mean Jesus with blue eyes and you bow under them and you pray, how do you think it makes her feel? It makes her feel, yeah, I have arrived, I am here, if God is white. Think, think about it yourself. If, which is what makes men superior too, in this capitalist patriarchal system. That's why it's hard for men not to be patriarchal, because the system enforces everything, it centers power. So think about it on race times too. Stop blaming white people about feeling superior. Blame yourselves about your inferiority. Now, one thing I want to say on our inferiority, and I know that it angers a lot of people. I was in Tunisia. Tunisians asked me and I had no answer. They said, you know where I'm from a French colony. I said, yeah, I come because you speak French apart from Arabic. They said, you know, we have written volumes about how the French tried to convert us to Christianity, and we refused. Then they asked me a question. How is the whole sub-Sahara island is never Christian? What was your religion? And I tried to explain, and they said, don't explain. Right from that statement, allow us to come to that you guys are weaklings. Maybe you should be good. How did you forsake spirituality for religion, knowing it? How do you continue? They said, we understand your ancestors at the time, maybe there was a gun on the head. There's no gun now. They are doing it willingly. Yeah, and I said to them, you know, I speak that language, but when I finish at every session speaking this, I get personal attacks. People come individually and tell me, yo, but you can't say that, yo, but. So I will say it repeatedly. For we will never deal with our inferiority for as long as we don't deal with our spirituality, yes. which was scientific. Can I ask you? This Islam and Christianity is so washing. They build pyramids. You know of the three races on earth, the only people who have done a feat that the other two races have never been able to overcome was building those pyramids. Spirituality and science colliding in one. Yes. So maybe instead of telling man who is it on Megan Mayo, you know, Fagashe Kevin. Go to those pyramids. Because they have power. Yeah. So I'm and if we will never decolonize for as long as we believe that our ancestors were demons, yeah. I have a question for every Christian who believes this. If your ancestors were demons, you are a demon too because you came from you. <laughs>